Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a really challenging one on God's mission, my mission. This is lesson number seven in that series entitled Mission to My Neighbor. It's the lesson for November 18 of 2023. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we come sitting at your feet once again, asking you to guide us to the presence of your Holy Spirit so that we may understand how better to reach out to those who are not far from us, but nearby. We realize that there is a challenge that, that, that needs to be accomplished because the world population is exploding and the church is not doing the job that it needs to do. May we be not a part of this problem, but a part of the solution is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mission to my neighbor. Hmm. Who is my neighbor? What is my mission to my neighbor? From our Bible study guide, we read, we all know that the, know the text, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, Luke 10, 27. Yet our love for God can become superficial if we say that we love God but do not obey Him. We think that we love God, but how is this love demonstrated in our day-to-day -day life? Loving God requires full commitment of our heart, soul, body, and mind daily. Anyone who can say that he or she loves God, doing it, however, requires conscious effort. However, even though loving God is good and important, God also wants us to love God others. Oh dear. Because our love for others reflects our love for God. And it does so in a powerful and very real way. 1 John 4.20 states, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And that verse always challenges me. I see, I mean, some people that I have to deal with People I see, I have to deal with. Anyway, yeah. Paul also says in Galatians 5.14 that all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> it's hard for me to understand those kinds of words. Uh, Jim, look, let's see what the Good News Bible says about 1 John 4 there. First of all, uh, excuse me, chap 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. If we say we love God, but hate our brothers and sisters, we are liars. For people cannot love God, whom they have not seen, if they do not love their brothers and sisters, whom they have seen. American Bible Society, Good News Translation. That's the problem. Some of them, you're not too sure about them when you see them. <laughs> behavior. Yeah. Does this verse seem correct to you? Well, I've never... But really, what is love, though, in, in, in that yeah. type of situation? Uh, well, clearly God speaks of love as a principle. Okay. And the principle means you love them because they are God's children. You love them because they need the love and you need to love them. It's, it's good for you. And you. You wouldn't do harm to them. Right. But you allow things to happen to them. Yeah, primarily because you don't have any control of that. Well, whatever it is, yeah. uh, 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 even, even if you had control, uh, th that is not our, our, our job. Some, th some th uh, consequences of uh, people's misbehavior, yeah. they, they suffer consequences. Mm -hmm. notice, that it, uh, well, um, notice that it says, if you do not love your brothers and sisters, does that imply our only other church members? No. So in the context, you could interpret to mean only other church members. That might make it a little easier. I don't know. I don't know. What? I, I'm not sure. Yeah. How should these ideas in this passage of Scripture apply to us in 2023? There are some questions that are so significant that they are asked over and over again, despite the fact that different people have given quite different answers. They are called the existential questions. And those questions are just in stating in one form, where did we come from? Why are we here? 
how can we do the most good while we are here? And of course, that not everybody's trying to do the most good, but how can we do, may, do something significant while we're here? And where do we go after we die? Those are pretty basic questions. In contrast to the length of time that the universe has existed, or even the length of time that our solar system has existed, our individual lives seem like a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. James 4.14 from the New King James Version. So the next question to ask is, if we do not spend time in eternity with God, God in heaven, what is the other option? Jennifer? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 30 to 32. And as for us, why would we run the risk of danger every hour? My brothers and sisters, I face death every day. The pride I have in you and our life in union with Christ Jesus our Lord makes me declare this. If I have, as it were, fought, quote, wild beasts here in Ephesus simply from human motives, what have I gained? But if the dead are not raised to life, then, as the saying goes, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we will die. Good news, Bible. I, um, when I read that, that quotation, I remember my visit to Ephesus and what I know about Ephesus, it is estimated that Ephesus had 250,000 inhabitants. We live in between a couple of cities here in Loma Linda, each with, you know, roughly that number of people. How did Paul, without any mass communication of any kind, arrive in that place and set the, turn the place upside down in just a short time? I mean, he, he, was, he wasn't an Ephesian. He was a foreigner. I mean, obviously he had God's help, but I mean, it, would that be possible in our day? If you just do something provocative enough, you will, you will get attention, whether well, it's good or bad. Well, here's, here's one of the things that they, he did, or not that he was responsible for, I guess you would say. They could take handkerchiefs from him take it to sick people and the sick people would get well. That would probably impress people. <laughs> that would be, well, um, and then the, uh, the quotation goes on to say, as Jennifer already read, us, read to us, well, go ahead and read the rest of it there. Um, did you finish it? I, I did finish it. Okay, and as we know, there are many other religions in the world. There are also many who don't think religion should have anything to do with our lives. Gordon? From the Bible Study Guide. For instance, our Muslim friends ask us questions related to Jesus' divinity, such as, where in the Bible does Jesus say he is God? Or why do you say there is one God when you have three persons in the Trinity? Though these seem to be provocative questions, yet the heartfelt need for Jesus can be genuine and can represent a deep longing or em emptiness of, the, of those questions, the, of those asking the questions. We don't know their hearts. We don't need to. We simply need to minister to others the best we can, regardless of their deepest motives. The Bible okay. Study Guide for Monday. Yeah. The Bible is full of principles and ideas illustrated by many stories that help to answer the most important questions. For example, Acts 17, 11. Myra? The people there in Berea were more open-minded than the people in Thessalon Thessalonica. They listened to the message with great eagerness, and every day they studied the scriptures to see if what Paul said was really true. Good news, Bible. And I'm going to ask you to read those next two verses in a moment. But that raises another question in my mind. They read the scriptures. Where did they get copies of the scriptures? Well, did the Jewish communities there have copies of the scriptures? Did they maybe go for prayer meeting? Yeah. Well, but it says every day they studied the scriptures. Well, maybe they went for prayer meeting every day. But somebody would still have to have copies of the scriptures. Maybe well, someone just, did. Incredibly maybe expensive. Maybe just somebody's editing yeah. a, a literary license. Well, no, we're not going to go there. Okay, go ahead. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 says, 
I passed on to you what I received, which is of the greatest importance, that Christ died for our sins, as written in the scriptures. And then 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful. Footnote. Every scripture is inspired by God. No, every... Every, every scripture inspired by God is also useful. Yes. That's the important part. For teaching the truth, rebuking error, correcting fault, and giving instruction for right living. Good News Bible. Now, the reason we need to say that, the, the footnote w version, is because a couple things. First of all, there were, we know from, from what Luke wrote to Theophilus at the beginning of his book, there are already people around spreading versions of the Gospels and stories and so forth like that and writing them down and so forth. And Paul is writing to Timothy. And he say, he's saying to Timothy, Timothy, you have learned from me how to distinguish between what is truth and what is not truth. Don't let any of these other stories that are going around distract you or, or make you think that, you know, what we, what we believe is not true. So that's, so it's, it's the scriptures which are inspired that are useful, not all those other things. Didn't scripture in that context just mean writings? Yes, exactly. So it didn't necessarily mean what we think of as a, ba a, book a bound. bound Bible. No. It wasn't a bound Bible. It was not, not. No. Yeah, it, at very best you had a scroll with a, book, with a handwritten copy of the Bible or par portions of one book of the Bible, yeah. The way that is generally written is it, it's uh, assumed that because something was in writing that it was inspired by God. And what you pointed out, the correct translation is it's only the inspired writings. Yeah. The, the writings that are inspired by God are useful. The rest of them yeah. may or may not be. Yeah. Okay, one more. Okay, Luke 10, 26. Jesus answered him, What did the scriptures say? How do you interpret them? Good news. Okay. However, there are many people who do not want to bother themselves with an effort to search the scriptures, to work out the answer. Someone give us the pablum version uh, of what they're supposed to believe, and that'll do. Others approach scripture with a number of preconceived ideas which prevent them from understanding the Bible correctly. Could we fall into one or the other of those categories? Of course, we need to recognize that the Bible stories happened in a different context and different cultural culture using different languages than we use today. It is important for us to try to understand the stories in their context. And that is a challenge we, we need to understand, but it's possible to deal with. But there is a big difference between having the right Bible answers and actually living them out in one's life. Oh dear. James 2, 17 through 22. And James, remember, was the older stepbrother of Jesus son of Joseph, but not of Mary. So it is with faith. If it is alone and includes no actions, then it is dead. But someone will say, one person has faith, another has actions. My answer is, show me how anyone can have faith without actions. I will show you my faith by my actions. Do you believe that there's only one God? Good. The demons also believe, and that's, that's the word that means faith. The demons also have faith and tremble with fear. You fool, do you want to be shown that faith without actions is useless? How was our ancestor Abraham put right with God? It was through his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. Can't you see his faith and his actions worked together? His faith made perfect. I'm sorry, his faith was made perfect through his actions. Wow. In other words, that's from our Good News Bible again. In other words, Christianity is a complete way of living our lives and not just a set of distinct beliefs or doctrines. And this is one of the things that so many people think, well, I believe all the right things. Doesn't that make me, you know, I'm just ready for the kingdom, right? James 2. Jim? James 2, verses 15 to 16. Suppose there are brothers or sisters who need clothing, excuse me, clean clothes and don't have enough to eat. What good is there in your saying to them, God bless you, keep warm and eat well, <laughs> if you don't give them the necessities of life? Good news, Bible. Pretty hard to argue with that argument, is it? How yeah, much? There, there is a version of the Bible, it, well, Bible, quote unquote, it's 
today's, uh, it's not called today's English, but it's um, for modern man or something. Mm -hmm. And it's with cartoons and so on. And there's this, no, it's a gospel according to Snoopy. That's what it was. Okay. <laughs> and here's a picture of Snoopy and, you know, the person out in the cold and so on. And have a good day. <laughs> you know, not help, but have a good day. I'll be praying for you. Yeah. yeah. Probably, yeah. Don't lift a finger, but. <laughs> How much do we care about the welfare of others? The members of the Philippian church were great friends of Paul, and they supported him to a considerable extent, even when he was in prison. They would send money to him and send other things he needed. In turn, he essentially said, you Philippians, quote now, you Philippians, need to look after one another's interest, not just your own. So, I mean, it seems like they were doing that. Probably the best known love passage in the entire Bible is 1 Corinthians 13. Jennifer? 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 13. I may be able to speak the languages of human beings and even of angels, but if I have no love, my speech is no more than a noisy gong or a clanging bell. I may have the gift of inspired preaching. I may have all knowledge and understand all secrets. I may have all the faith needed to move mountains, but if I have no love, I am nothing. I may give away everything I have and even give up my body to be burnt, but if I have no love, this does me no good. Love is patient and kind. It is not jealous or conceited or proud. Love is not ill-mannered or selfish or irritable. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Love is not happy with evil, but is happy with the truth. Love never gives up, and its faith, hope, and patience never fail. Love is eternal. There are inspired messages, but they are temporary. There are gifts of speaking in strange tongues, but they will cease. There is knowledge, but it will pass. For our gifts of knowledge and of inspired messages are only partial, but when what is perfect comes, then what is partial will disappear. When I was a child, my speech, feelings, and thinking were all those of a child. Now that I have grown up, I have no more use for childish ways. What we see now is like a dim image in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. What I know now is only partial. Then it will be complete as complete as God's knowledge of me. Meanwhile, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love from the Good Amen. News Bible. Wonderful. Is it really humanly possible to live up to all those criteria? Wow. Not without God's help. We do not know how the foreknowledge of Jesus actually worked. Was it that his father had revealed to him each evening or in his night in prayer what was going to happen the next day? Or did he have inherent ability to perceive the truth about those who came to him and questioned him? What do you think? Did he have that kind of information? Just somebody walks by and he knows all about them just by looking at them? Or did God in, in the night before say, tomorrow you're going to have this and this and this and this happen to you? And this is the story behind those people? Oh, yeah. I, you know, even today we have people around us who are more perceptive and in interpreting your body language, your, mm -hmm. you know. So maybe there's a combination of... Uh, it could be some, partly some of both, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's... If you read Desire of Ages from Ellen White, of course, she says, like, for, man, for example, that paralyzed man that they, they let down through the roof, she says he saw the man in his home way before he even, you know, and he, draw, he drew him to him. Uh, and there are other times when it says something like that. That's, that's not humanly possible as far as I know. Anyway. At least not by you or me. Yeah, you mean there might be some humans that do things that I can't do and you can't do? Yeah, but I don't think even those. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the, um, 
In the case of one Bible scholar who tried to trap Jesus, Jesus turned, that was, those are the scribes of his day, Jesus turned the question back on him. The scholar was able to answer his own question. Remember the question, who's my neighbor? Luke 10, 25. Who, the the teacher of the law came up and tried to trap Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to receive eternal life? From the Good News Bible. In the context, it seems pretty clear that the so-called scholar of the scriptures was hoping to trap Jesus into saying something the Pharisees and Sadducees could use against him. Ellen White suggested that he was not, he was not so, this particular scholar, this particular scribe was not so friendly with the Pharisees and Sadducees and had a lot of questions about their long list of do's and don'ts. So that gives you a little idea more why he might have been asking. Because this is a question they, they, they discussed and, and asked each other about it. It's in some of the, the Mishnah and so forth like that. But as usual, Jesus managed to turn the, this question around to, to teach a very important lesson. Doesn't the question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life, seem like a very important question? Myra? Is, is there anything one can do to, uh, to receive eternal life? Is that what Jesus is trying to say, that you can't or... Matthew 19, 18 and 19, I think it is. Yeah. Six, six things. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the Philippian jailer asked in X, or 26, I think. 16. 16. Asked the same thing. You know, what must I do to be saved? Have faith. There, there isn't anything you can do. You can listen. That's the number one. Uh, what, see, yeah. And uh, what a mark was. 29 or 20, to listen, the most important, and Shema, uh, yeah. Deuteronomy 6, listen. If you don't want to listen, unfortunately, many times it's translated as obey. How do you know who's, you know, you got to listen and process the data before you determine whether it's, uh, what your action is going to be. You better not obey the wrong person. That's exactly right. Okay, well, Myra. Luke 10, 27 and 28, which follows up on Gordon's. The man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as you love yourself. You're right, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Jesus himself said it. Now, of course, what do we know about those two statements? Where do they come from? Deuteronomy come from Jesus himself. Why do I say that? Because he inspired Moses to say those things. One is in Deuteronomy 6 and the other one is in Leviticus 19, 18. So Jesus was just quoting himself. When the Bible scholar asked Jesus why, who his neighbor was, he got a story instead of a plain answer. And this is a very familiar story, but it's a very good one. Luke 10, 30 to 37. Jesus answered, there was once a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. That's this, in those days, it's, it's still a fairly narrow ravine that goes down there, where when robbers attacked him, stripped him and beat him up, leaving him half dead. It so happened that a priest was going down that road, but when he saw the man, he walked on by on the other side. I mean, you don't want to get too close. In the same way, a Levite also came along, went over and looked at the man, and then walked on by on the other side. But a Samaritan... Is that, is that Aren't the priests Levites? Yes. So this is two Levites. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, but a Samaritan who was traveling that way came upon the man, and by, I'll get, it'll get more detailed as you, you will see in a moment, Gordon. Uh, and when he saw him, he, his heart was filled with pity. He went over to him, poured oil and wine on his wounds and bandaged him. Then he put the man on his own animal and took him to an inn where he took care of him. What was the risk that the, I mean, this Samaritan guy obviously had some money because he was able to pay for an inn. I mean, what was his risk of him being beaten up and st everything taken? The next day he took out two silver coins and each one of those silver coins was worth a, a laboring man's wages for a whole day and gave them to the innkeeper. Take care of him, he told the innkeeper. When I come back this way, I will pay 
whatever else you spend on him. That's amazing. And Jesus concluded, in your opinion, which one of these three acted like a neighbor towards the man attacked by the robbers? The teacher of the law answered, the one who was kind to him. He would not even mention the name Samaritan. Jesus replied, you go then, do the same. <laughs> and Ellen White is so marvelous on this. Myra? Oh, no. Jim, I guess it's you. This was no imaginary scene, but an actual occurrence which was known to be exactly as represented. The priest and the Levite who had passed by on the other side were in the company that listened to Christ's words. Ellen wow. White, the Zero of Ages. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how they felt. I hope they probably say, I hope he doesn't point us out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, there's more. Keep reading. The Levite was of the same tribe as was the wounded, bruised sufferer. Which Ellen means, White. yeah, go mm. ahead. So also he was a... <laughs> he was a Levite. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, so two Levites pass by the Levite and then the Samaritan helps him. Okay. And the Bible study guide further down says... Are there people around us who have been unjustly treated by others? Have we done whatever we can to help them? It is true that sometimes pastors and elders and members do not help those who need help. Sometimes people of another faith may be kinder toward people of the community than we are. We may talk about being kind, yet others may meet the needs of the people that we don't address. If our faith means anything, we must reach out and help those in need. Jesus concluded the story of the Good Samaritan by asking, who among the three that was tr a truly a neighbor to the person who needed help? My wife follows with, thus the creation, excuse me, thus the question, who is my neighbor is forever answered. Christ was shown that our neighbor does not mean merely of the church, one of the church, one of the church, or faith to which we bel we belong, it has no reference to race, color, or class distinction. Our neighbor is every person who needs our help. Our neighbor is every soul who is wounded and bruised by the adversary. Our neighbor is everyone who is pr the property of God. The desire of ages, and then the B BSG challenge is. Begin praying daily for someone who is different from you, or even for someone you may not personally like. Wow. Pray for somebody you do not personally like. Can we do that? Is there any such person? Well, that's a good There's question. A lot of people Might that are unlikable, but. <laughs> okay, and then challenge up the next level, list at least three names of your acquaintances who are non-Adventists, identify their needs, emotional, physical, social, and consider how you can minister personally to those needs. What can you do practically for them in the coming week? Wow. Mm -hmm. From our Bible study guide for Thursday. That's quite a challenge. It is interesting to notice that the scribe, who was supposed to be a biblical scholar, could not even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. So he said, the one who had mercy on him. How might this story be applied in our day? Should we be assisting whenever we see someone stop beside our road who might need help? If not, are there other situations in which the story might be applicable? Yes. Okay, what do you think? Yes. Do we know the other members of our church well enough to know if some of them are hurting or needy or even hungry? Does your church have a definite plan for reaching out to help those, these people? I mean, look at these challenges. In another encounter with a scholar trying to trap Jesus, we read. From Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. Jesus answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the most important commandment. The second most important commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. The whole law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets depend on these two commandments from the Good News Bible. 
Okay, it seems like people would have discovered after a while that every time they raised a question with Jesus, trying to trap him, they would end up in trouble, <laughs> in trouble themselves. Do we also have troubles learning from our mistakes? Hmm, that couldn't apply to any of us, could it? <laughs> Is it easy to love your neighbor as you love yourself? How many people do you think are actually able to do that? Notice these words about that problem from Ellen White. I mean, obviously these are very, very pertinent questions, and so she comments about every one of them, almost. From Christ's Object Lessons, love is the underlying principle of God's government in heaven and earth, and it must be the foundation of the Christian's character. This alone can make and keep him steadfast. This alone can enable him to withstand trial and temptation. Okay, love. Compare Ellen White's words with these by Paul, Micah, and John. Galatians 5, 14. The whole law is summed up in one commandment. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let me go on. Yeah, go ahead. Micah 6, 6 through 8. What shall I bring to the Lord, the God of heaven, when I come to worship him? Shall I bring the best calves to burn as offerings to him? Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep and endless streams of olive oil? Shall I offer him my firstborn child to pay for my sins? No, the Lord has told us what is good. He, what he requires of us is this. Do what is just to show constant love and to live in humble fellowship with our Lord, with our God. Okay, are those things that we can do? Yeah, of course. Should be. Yeah. Okay, okay we'll go back to 1 John 4. If we say we love God, but hate our brothers, and, oh, I'm sorry, my computer is jumping here, and hate um, our brothers and sisters, we are liars. For people cannot love God whom they have not seen, if they do not love their brothers and sisters whom they have seen. The command that Christ has given us is this, all who love God must love their brother or sister also. Does that mean if I, if I have anybody that I have trouble getting along with, I can't love God? I'd rather see him use instead of the word command that it is a prescription of how to live. God does not command anybody to do anything. And it's a, it's a terrible paradigm that, that many, most trans, or many translations use, that God commands this. He doesn't command. We certainly are aware of the fact that there are many people in our world, especially what is described as the third world, who are hungry and needy. And I spent 17 years in East Africa, I can tell you. I, I've watched children die of malnutrition, and that's just so sad. But most of us do not have the privilege of going and trying to help them personally. It is, of course, possible to send money to help through agencies like the Adventist Development Relief Agency, Red Cross, and such organizations. But what about the poor and needy in our own societies? Do we personally know someone who's hurting because they are hungry and or needy? What about the guys who are living under the bridge and beside either the railroad tracks or the car or the... Or the car auto overpasses and so forth. What about people who are facing injustice, even bigotry? This is a huge problem around the world today. Well. Um, is it? Pure religion? Pure, is it my turn? Oh. Mm -hmm. Ellen G. White. Pure religion and undefiled before the Father is this to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Good deeds are the fruit that Christ requires us to bear. Kind words, deeds of benevolence, of tender regard for the poor, the needy, the afflicted. When hearts sympathize with hearts burden, with discouragement and grief, when the hand dispenses to the needy, when the naked are clothed, the stranger made welcome to a seat in your parlor and a place in your heart. Angels are coming very near, and an answering strain is responded to in heaven. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for just a second. Is it safe for us to, to welcome strangers into our home in 2023? 
you want to be a statistic, uh, run to the risk of being a statistic. Yeah. So where does this, I mean, does that mean that because we live in a dangerous society, uh, we can't do this anymore? I think there are ways to do this without pulling a person out of their homelessness. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, we need to help the homeless, but listening to your next door neighbor talk about their needs or their surgeries or their whatever mm -hmm. and helping them may be just as beneficial. Does this mean that we should have a pocket full of $5 bills and every time we see somebody stand on the corner, we hand one out? Maybe. <laughs> no. these, are, these are tough questions. Okay. Um, every act of justice, mercy, and benevolence makes melody in heaven. The Father from his throne beholds those who do these acts of mercy and numbers them with his most precious treasures. Quote, and they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. End quote. Every merciful act to the needy, the suffering, is regarded as though done to Jesus. When you succor the poor, sympathize with the afflicted and oppressed, and befriend the orphan, you bring yourselves into a closer relationship to Jesus. From Ellen G. White Testimonies for the Church. Volume wow. Two. There are many religions in the world that are based on salvation by works. Is it possible that there are some who, quote, love their neighbors, end quote, in order to earn a way to heaven? You I, huh? I, I, I'm sure there are. Yes. I could think of some examples of people who are not even Christians, that that's, that was their attitude. How can we tell whether we are trying to earn our way to heaven by doing good deeds, or whether our Christianity just produces the right kind of behavior? Do you do it because you're trying to earn something, or you do it just because it's the right thing to do? Philippians 2, 5 through 8, the attitude you should have is the one that Jesus, that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. Good News Bible. Wow. How good are we at identifying our natural prejudices and biases? We don't have any of those, do we? <laughs> don't, speak everybody, yourself. don't everybody speak up at the same time. Jesus often faces the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Bible scholars one way or another. Finally, near the end of his life, he had these words to say. And we're going to sure to share this passage. We've, I've left out some of it, but it's a lengthy passage. But boy, the words are pretty potent. You want to start, Myra? Sure. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples. Teachers of the law and the Pharisees are the authorized interpreters of Moses' law. Let me, let me interrupt there for a second. From the days of Ezra in the Old Testament, there were really very few people who could even read, and probably even fewer that could write. And so the Bible, the copies of Scripture were very carefully copied, so forth like that, by these people. And so if you were good enough and you educated enough to do that kind of stuff, it was assumed that you would be informed with the material. I mean, how well would you know Genesis if you had copied the whole book by hand? I mean, think about it, yeah. you know? Um, and so they assumed people would tend to ask them questions. Well, what about this? What about that? Well, if you ask a person a question and they, they spend a lot of time study, reading it and studying, maybe copying it, you would expect them to know the correct answer. So pretty soon, they, they pretty soon put themselves on a pedestal and said, yeah, we know the answers to Scripture. And of course, they 
started adding and adding and adding to the scriptures. And so they consider themselves authorities. So that's the kind of people we're talking about here. In Matthew 23, Jesus 17, or excuse me, seven places, Jesus says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you're hypocrites. That's what we're reading right now. Go ahead. Okay, so um, going back, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, are the authorized interpreters of Moses' law. So you must obey and follow everything they tell you to do. Do not, however, imitate their actions because they don't practice what they preach. Oh boy. <laughs> How terrible for you, teachers of the law and, fa and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You lock the door to the kingdom of heaven in the people's faces, and you yourselves don't go in, nor do you allow those who are trying to enter. Okay, let me, I'll, I'll pick it up there. How terrible for you blind guides. You teach if someone swears by the temple, he isn't bound by his vow, but if he swears by the gold in the temple, he is bound. <laughs> Blind fools, which is more important, the gold or the temple which makes the gold holy? How terrible for you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give to God a tenth even of the seasoning herbs, such as mint, dill, and cumin, but you neglect to obey the really important teachers of the law, such as justice and mercy and honesty. I mean, those will cost you something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These you should practice without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain a fly out of your drink, but swallow a camel. How terrible for you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs which look fine on the outside but are full of bones and decaying corpses on the inside. In the same way, on the outside you appear good to everybody, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and sins. Jim, you want to pick it up there? Uh, sorry, verse 29, how terrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you make the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of those who lived good lives. And you claim that if you had lived during the time of your ancestors, as a result, the punishment for the murder of all innocent people will fall on you. For the murder of innocent Abel to the murder of Zechariah, son of Merakiah, whom you've murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you, indeed, the punishment for all these murders will befall on the people of this day. Wow. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you killed the prophets and stoned the messengers God has sent you. How many times have I wanted to put my arms around all of your people just to, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not let me and so your temple will be abandoned and empty. From now on, I tell you, you will never see me again until you say, God bless him who has come forth in the name of the Lord. I, you read a passage like that, and we, we just read it, and we, you know, we say, oh, that's okay. Well, yeah, we understand that, and we know that Jesus would die, and we know about all the trials, and we know that he rose from the dead, and there he was afterwards. But imagine the people who actually were there, and they heard him say this, and then they saw that, and they, you know, what did the Pharisees and the Sadducees see on Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays after a resurrection morning? They were scared to death that they would walk down the street, and there would be Jesus. Mm. Regarding those uh, seven woes regarding the uh, scribes and Pharisees, remember Jeremiah was a precursor to that. In Jeremiah 8, verse 8, he says, The scribes have said, Oh, we've got the law, but their lying pen has made it into a lie. Mm -hmm. Well, there are, th in other words, their version of things was a lie, not the, not the scripture, but the what they. Well, had. Who's, who are the scribes? Are? It says the scripture. The scribes have made it into a line. No, the, the prophets who wrote, who wrote the scriptures, not the, not the scribes. Not the, well, the scribes are the only ones who copied. There's a, how many prophets are there that, that really qualify as a prophet? Well, that's. Yeah. There's, a lot yeah. of that was edited up. Uh, that material was edited after uh, the Babylonian captivity. Well, it was translated from one language to another. Oh, well, that's still in editing. From now on, I tell you, you will never see me again until you say, God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. Did they think about that when they wa I mean, Jesus was walking around in Jerusalem for 40 days mm -hmm. with the disciples. 
after the resurrection. Not every day, obviously, but from time to time. If Jesus were here today, would he be crying over your church or my church? Many people feel that the life of Jesus is spelled out in the New Testament. The life of Jesus is spelled out in the New Testament is very different from the descriptions of God in the Old Testament. However, consider these comments. Jennifer, I think that's yours. From the Bible Study Guide. The prophets urged the people and their leaders to, quote, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow from Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. Does that sound a little bit like uh, what these passages like James in the New Testament? Mm -hmm. Almost word for word, isn't it? Go ahead. And forbade the oppression of the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor from Zechariah 7, verse 10. The prophets also were fierce in their condemnation of all injustice. Elijah rebuked King Ahab for murdering Naboth and stealing his vineyard. Amos fulminated against the rulers of Israel because in return for bribes, they trampled on the heads of the poor, crushed the needy, and denied justice to the oppressed instead of letting justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. Okay. A comment by John R. W. Stott, decisive issues facing Christians today. What's he saying? Those issues haven't changed since hundreds of years before Christ, right? Still the same story. Uh, go on. Huh? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, from Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. Learn to do right. See that justice is done. Help those who are oppressed. Give orphans their rights and defend widows. From the Good News Bible. Okay, so here's a question. Do you think there were more orphans in Jesus' day and or even back in the Old Testament, Isaiah's day, than there are now? How often? I mean, we, we, we don't even think about orphans today, basically. Uh, do you know any orphans that are immediate friends and neighbors or something like that? I guess technically I would be an orphan since both my parents are dead, but you know, that's not... <laughs> Not what we're talking about, right? We have a different system here. Yeah. There's orphans in the world, but in the United States, we have the foster care system, so. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, and the last verse is from Zechariah chapter 7, verse 10. Do not oppress widows, orphans, foreigners who live among you, or anyone else in need, and do not plan ways of harming one another, from the Good News Bible. Okay, and... You think of well, things like what's happening on the border and so forth, yes? Well, I, the fact that they, Zachariah had to write that, don't plan ways to harm others. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it's no Crazy. better today. By the way, I'm going to take just a moment. We've got a little extra time, not much, but a little extra. I'm back up here a little bit to where we read about Matthew. I should have mentioned we were there. Um, talking about these things here. You notice it says, um, he's talking about this stuff and he says, from the murder of innocent Abel to the murder of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered be between the temple. Why does he choose those? Well, we know, we know why he chose Abel. He was the very first one, right? Why did he choose Zechariah? The last one in the Hebrew Bible. Last one in the Hebrew Second Chronicles to die, and he was the son of who? Not Berechiah. Not Berechiah. That's a mistake. He was the son of Jehoiada. Are we are Bible writers allowed to make mistakes? Or copyists or scribes? Well, there's no reason for a copyist to put it. Maybe I suppose, but it it would have been have to have been way back at the very beginning because. Uh, all the copies have it. Mm. All the copies we have available to us. And if scop the copies are supposed to take care of things and make sure it's done right, why didn't someone fix it? That's the kind of questions that I would ask. Um, okay, dropping back down here. The prophets and urge. No, we read that. I'm sorry. Read already. The Bible study guide. Yeah. 
The structure and society of Israel exalted labor, denounced idleness, expected fathers to train their sons to acquire skills with their hands, furthered human re reciprocity and justice, and demonstrated an active concern for one's neighbors. And notably, quote, it respected the dignity of both man, men and women, the bearers of the divine image. And, I mean, think of all the rules that they had back in the days of Moses when their nation was supposed to be a theocracy. Uh, and what a, you know... That's a misnomer. It wasn't well, a, that's what it was supposed to be. I'm not saying what it was. I'm saying it was supposed no, to be. God is going to control them? God no, didn't, no, didn't no, control it, them. It well, that's say, theocrat means God controlling. Well, maybe you don't like the wording, but the idea was that God was supposed to be the one. I mean, look at what they did. They didn't even move until God picked up his cloud and moved on. I mean, that's, those are things that God directed. He, and any time there was any kinds of a problem, he would come down to get, instruct Moses and, and say, uh, do this, do that. That's it was quite often was for, the, for their protection. I'm not, yeah. Obviously, it was there for the, yeah. the argument about that, uh, but it was at God's instructions. Um, well, they listened, I guess. Well, yeah, when they listened. <laughs> Moreover, worship and obedience to God are directly related to justice and philanthropy. These sets go hand in hand, just as justice and mercy to one's neighbor are related to walking humbly before God. All instructions and regulations for the well-being and fair treatment of the poor, alien, orphan, and widow, and vulnerable have their origins in God, the one who cares for his children and shows the compassion and mercy to whomsoever needs him. And so that raises the question. Uh, we have a government now that... Uh, has all the rules about how people are supposed to be taken care of, and they, they, they support to a certain extent. People are orphans, people are widows, and so forth. Does that remove the responsibility from us? No. No. Should our churches take responsibility for that kind of stuff? Should we as church organizations, local church organizations, take responsibility for that? I mean, these are... Challenging questions. Well, in an echo of the biblical message, one writer sums up in this way the gospel directive for care for the poor. Quote, to speak about poverty is to touch the heart of God. To speak about poverty is to touch the heart of God. Mm -hmm. How does God feel about those poor people? Some of these questions can be very perplexing. Where are we? Oftentimes, Gordon? from the Bible study guide, oftentimes the question is asked, how can my neighbor, who is often the poor, the homeless, and the unemployed, be helped to secure the blessings of God's providence and to live the life Jesus intended humans to live? Okay, and you know that uh, there's a state statement that's used very, very well. Um, that uh, if you want to help someone, you don't just give them a fish, you teach them how to fish. Mm -hmm. And how can we do that? Should the church be doing that kind of stuff in our day? I mean, wouldn't that be... If we were doing that kind of stuff on large scale, which of course would require a lot of effort from a lot of people, how would that impact our church? I once belonged to a small church in northern Baltimore, and I've, some of you have heard me talk about this, and they were doing this kind of stuff all the time, and that church doubled its membership in about nine months. People came there, just, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's, it's easy to do that, maybe easier to do that in a smaller church. Well, here's a statement from Ellen White that provides light on the subject. Myra? If men would give more heed to the teaching of God's Word, they would find this a solution of these problems that perplex them. Much might be learned from the Old Testament in regard to the labor question and the relief of the poor. In God's plan for Israel, every family had a home on the land with sufficient ground for tilling. Thus, 
were provided both the means and the incentive for useful, industrious, and self-supporting life. And no de devising of men has it ever improved upon that plan. To the world's departure from, its o from it is owing to a large degree the poverty and wretchedness of that exists today. Ministry of Healing. Yeah, so um, it's easy when the government, quote, is supposed to be responsible, think, oh, well, then that's not my responsibility. Oh, don't expect me to do anything. Is God's purpose that the rich and the poor shall be closely bound together by the ties of sympathy and helpfulness? And I've read a lot of Ellen White's materials and read the Bible many times. And I've often wondered, what would happen if our local churches were pretty much responsible for what happened in our local community as they were in biblical times? How different would it be from the government-run programs or you have to make, try to make a rule that fits everybody and, they, and it doesn't fit anybody very well, whereas the local situation, we could, we could take people one by one and say, yes, this is, this is this person's need, this is what we can do to help them, help them find a job, help them to do whatever, you know, or invite them to our homes and, and, and feed them, because we could do that for a few people in, in a local church setting, but you can't do that on a national-wide scale. So, it's, those are difficult challenges. Have you ever taken it upon yourself to look around in your community to see if there are people who, there who are needy? How would, that, how would that work? The message of, okay, I guess that would be my turn. The message of the Old Testament is a call to an ethical lifestyle modeled in what God has done for us in Christ. It's interesting that it talks about the Old Testament and then it talks about model for us in Christ. It has to do with following God's principles through living a life of witnessing to helping and loving the neighbor and those in need as yourself. And again, I, I, I think the same thing. Where, where are we? Could our church be doing some of these kinds of things? The ministry of compassion manifested in the life and ministry of Jesus was the best possible example provided by the disciples, apostles, followers, and new believers of the early apostolic church. Jesus, otherwise known as Emmanuel, God with us, dwelt among men and women, restore and save. And it's time for us to close. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these words which give us challenging ideas about how things could possibly be done or should be done even today in our world. Help us to know how we can reach out to others and show the love that you show to us is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen.